today we're going to talk about um, all the causes of infections in the GI tract, and we're going to hit on all these bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. Uh, we're going to talk about the most common Norwalk Campy Giardia <coughs> and those with the highest mortality, which includes the Salmonella, Listeria, and Toxo. So, um, diarrhea, back in the year listed, was number five killer in people globally with years of life lost. And if you looked in certain continents like Africa, Diarrhea was the fourth leading cause of death. And because of the rotavirus vaccine, diarrhea causing death in the world is going off the top 20 list and may already be gone. And then um, if you order a GI panel for a diarrhea workup, at least at Moffitt and most other places, you will pick all of these 15 bacteria, four protozoa, and five viruses, which is a multiplex panel. So you need to know three things about each one. So if you find Plesiomonas shigalloides or enteroaggregative E. coli, you need to know what that means and what to do with it. So here is an example of positive test for plesiomonas using the film array GI panel made by BioFire. So if you have a example, this is the way to learn. So if you have a 32-year-old with diarrhea, liquid stool has ultimately turned to a rice water stool and the person is so dehydrated with sunken eyes and wrinkled hands called washerwoman's hands, as you would see here. And the area where they were at looked like this. And you can see that the rice water stool, would you would recognize that as what? Cholera. Cholera. Right. Vibrio cholera, and it's shaped as a comma. It has a motility by this flagellum. And um, the other curve-shaped bacteria are all the Vibrios, the Campylobacters, and the Helicobacters. So those are the three curved gram-negative rods. Vibrio is oxidase positive, and I have had a lab misidentify it as Pseudomonas, which is also oxidase positive. Now, Vibrio is the classic secretory diarrhea, fecal leukocyte negative, no bloody diarrhea, and it's because the organism is not invasive. It does not kill the enterocyte. It um, sticks onto the surface and then it messes with the sodium channels and the pumping out of water, sodium cyclic AMP gets onto the locked on configuration. So you lose tons of salt water. And um, when you take the World Health Organization dehydration uh, powder and mix it with water and have it rehydrate people, it has sodium chloride and glucose is important uh, and water. Those are the four main ingredients. So this is sort of the mechanistic action of how Vibrio cholera messes with the biochemical structures in the cell with the cyclic AMP locked into the on configuration. Um, and then the strain that is the most concerning is the O1 strain. The non-O1 is less virulent. The classic drug 
when used as doxycycline. And other drugs include Cipro and Azithromycin. Sometimes we don't even treat it and just rehydrate the person and get them through the acute event. Uh, most people feel like cholera started in Bangladesh, and the capital is Dhaka, where uh, they have a cholera center there for research. From there, it spread throughout Asia and into the Middle East. And from the Middle East, Africa and Europe, and then from Europe, Africa to Central, South, and North America. And ultimately now, this is where cholera is along the equator. And um, the El Tor strain is the strain that exists in the Gulf of Mexico and the hemispheres that we live in. Um, and there's been seven great pandemics since the 19th century, the last one being in 1991, which was the El Tor cholera outbreak. And if you look at the hot spots for where is cholera most notable, Florida is included there. This is a bed for cholera because the patient can't sit on the toilet to go. They don't they're too dehydrated, so they have to go to the bathroom laying down. This is the Haiti cholera tent with the beds and going to the bathroom into the bucket on the floor under the bed. And uh, this is the hot spots in Haiti for cholera in blue there, more so than the lighter color. And what was unique about the cholera outbreak in Haiti is they found out it wasn't the El Tor strain. It was actually a foreign strain that the community had no immunity to. The community had the immunity to El Tor, but the UN peacekeepers were from Nepal as they rotate different countries every few months. And at the UN site in the left corner green, Someone was colonized with cholera, and when they went to the bathroom, their sewage system was leaking into the river, and then from the river, it went downstream, and then the village nearby was the first to be affected, and then from there, it went globally to the Haitian community with no immunity with a widespread outbreak. And uh, this is where you find most of your cholera in the world from that article. Now the father of modern day epidemiology is John Snow and he um, stopped a cholera outbreak in London by analyzing the epidemiological death rate data of people who had died of a diarrhea like illness and he noticed that the majority of people had gotten water from the Soho district of London, and therefore he concluded that the water supply in one particular area of Soho was the source, and he therefore uh, changed the whole theory of spread of cholera from miasma, the air, to water, which was a blasphemy of that day. And, and People did not believe him at first, but eventually it caught on. And what did he do? He took the handle off the pump so you could not pump water from that source. And when they looked and investigated it, it was the 40th Broad Street pump in London. And when they looked closer at that London pump in the middle, they found that the sewer pipes that were nearby were leaking and the leaking sewer got into the cistern of clean water and therefore it was contaminated. And that it was the way that uh, he figured out the water supply was the problem and they stopped it by not getting water from that well. And then Richard Ayler visited London and he specifically went to 40th Broad Street 
which looks like this, and those guys are leaning against the actual pump, but not the one from 150 years ago. And there is the plaque honoring John Snow, the Soho cholera epidemic, and they have honored him by naming a pub on the corner as the John Snow Pub or Saloon. And then on the door, again, there is the famous John Snow 1854 cholera water connection. So, Vibrio cholera. Remember, there's many different serological groups, but it's the O1 that is the most pathogenic. And if you were to pick an antibiotic for cholera or any of the Vibrios, uh, the big three, as we mentioned, were the tetracyclines, the macrolides, and the quinolones, uh, usually the, the doxycyclines. Now, what's the leading cause of traveler's diarrhea? Any guesses? E. coli. E. coli, and what kind of E. coli? It's called E. tech enterotoxigenic E. coli is the leading cause. If you look at what's the probability of any infection in your travels, traveler's diarrhea with E. tech is going to dominate the probability list. And if you look at traveler's diarrhea in the world, again, you can see the hot tropical areas are most dominant. ETEC is the most common in general. Um, one study broke down the world into four sections, and ETEC dominated them all, except Southeast Asia seemed to have more Campylobacter than ETEC. And number two is mostly enteroaggregative E. coli. So here's your breakdown of traveler's diarrhea in the world, but in general, E. tech is number one. And then you get it by handling other people who have not washed their hands, shaking their hands. Ice can be a big one. And the food, of course, especially if it can't be peeled, it could be contaminated on the surface. And then if you were to take prophylaxis for traveler's diarrhea, according to the literature, your three options are bismuth, Cipro, and Rifaximin. And if you actually acquire traveler's diarrhea and you want to treat it with something, the treatment is bismuth, lopyramide, cipro, rifaximin, or azithro. You can find this in the JAMA article, Traveler's Diarrhea, from 2015, and the guru of diarrhea is Herbert DuPont. Now, if you come back three months from your travel and your diarrhea is still persisting, what is your most likely diagnosis? Any guess? IBS. Right, post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And what is the best treatment for post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome? Well, number one with the highest is linaclotide. Number two is antidepressants. And then Third is peppermint oil, rifaximin, things like that. And that could be found in the article in JAMA Review 2015 IBS. Now, if you have a bloody diarrhea and you have a low inoculum 100 organisms causing infection with a colitis with fecal leukocytes, What's the likely organism? Low inoculum, colitis, invasive. Shigella. So that's Shigella. And here is an example of Shigella invading the enterocytes, causing a massive inflammation. 
and the neutrophils coming in there and macrophages and lots of cytokines and sugar-like toxin damaging cells. So you have invasion and sugar-like toxin. So Shigella, unlike the Vibrios and Campy, is non-modal. Unlike E. coli, it's lactose negative. And unlike Salmonella, it's H2S negative, which makes this black color on the colony. And remember, it's the 100 cell small inoculum infection. The most pathogenic is dysentery A, and the most common is Sony I. And there is an example of Shigella, and which is most common. And the clinical features, as I mentioned, is ulcers, sugar toxin, and invasion, and fecal leukocyte. Uh, and dysentery with bloody diarrhea. Uh, and then if you look at an auger plate, it does not have the H2S like salmonella. We usually treat it with a third generation cephalosporin, quinolone, or macrolide. And some cases may not get treated, but most of them do. And the uh, problem is, is that drug resistance is on the increase. Now, if you have a ulceration of your ileal cecal area and it perforates and you have red macules and your colon is very inflamed, what would you think you might have? And you have the Faget sign or pulse temperature deficit. Salmonella. Yes, and which salmonella is the granddaddy of them all is salmonella typhi. Typhoid fever, rose spots, ileocecal area, and um, the pyres, patches, lymph nodes, the liver spleen involvement, the gallbladder may be involved, and then extra intestinal spread includes the bones and even the vascular system. And unlike Shigella, you have to eat 100,000 to a million organisms uh, unless you're on antacids or other immune suppressed issues. And you may even become a carrier. So at least for typhoid, you may actually not present with diarrhea. You may present with abdominal pain and fever and then this nonspecific abdominal pain. And then you may ultimately get the relative bradycardia and the rose spots with or without diarrhea. And you have three outcomes. You either improve, you perforate, or you become a carrier. And Salmonella classically loves the intracellular compartments of your liver, spleen, lymph nodes, macrophages. Uh, and then it may produce the H2S and look like black colonies. We usually use a third-generation cephalosporin, a macrolide like azithro. Cipro is sort of shunned and not usually used, but it could work as well. And you want to remember giving them Decadron if they're very sick because they actually have a survival advantage in addition to the antibiotics, because their immune response with cytokine release syndrome is killing them in, in addition to the organism invading. Now, if you do have a carrier state, you may need to treat it for three months, which is a long time, and may have to remove the gallbladder. Uh, the famous person published in 1906 who had infected multiple households because she was the cook and her name was? Mary. Mary. Mary, Mary Malone, right? Typhoid Mary. So Typhoid Mary eventually had to spend time in jail because she kept going back to what she only knew what to do, which was to cook. And then 
she was a carrier and not washing hands adequately and infecting the food, which then infect the household. So typhoid causing intercutaneous fistulas, perforations, peritonitis is a big thing in parts of Africa, Asia, more so than Central South America. And this is a surgeon's pictures of perforated typhoid with holes in the ileum, multiple, and sewing those after doing a resection and reanastomosis. And this patient is the highlighted patient who was three with three weeks of illness with septic peritonitis perforated. And after multiple surgeries and recovery, she lived another day to um, heal up from typhoid six weeks later, healthy. Uh, and then they noticed that a lot of African kids had a everted umbilicus. So if you touch it, you're touching the uh, peritoneum right under it. And if it's tender, then maybe that might be a need to go to surgery. And so um, you could do the zipper approach because you might need to do a few little surgery cleanouts depending on response to therapy. And there she is with her recovery. So um, they published their data in just 10 months. They had 191 cases of perforated typhoid and their mortality was 16%, which was lower than the literature. So that was an example of a good outcome when you aggressively know what you're looking for. And they even named the sign about the tender umbilicus. And there you have it. OK, other outbreaks in the literature. This one was in Uganda, perforated typhoid. Now, you think typhoid is not really found in the U.S., which is true, but occasionally something happens, like in South Florida, Miami area. They had the shipment of this fruit called mame from Central America. And as you pick this fruit, whoever's picking it in Central America could contaminate it or it's made into this frozen concentrate and whatever factory in Central America that makes the fruit and doesn't necessarily wash it well or puts it into the vat for the frozen concentrate, which is then sent around the world, this frozen concentrate of mame, which is used to make milkshakes like mango milkshake, strawberry milkshake, etc., that fruit uh, had typhoid within the concentrate. Even though it was frozen, it survived. And there is the outbreak that was published in South Florida with the mame and the typhoid in Miami without ever leaving the country. So there are occasional outbreaks of typhoid, which then gets investigated. Um, and then in this study in Egypt, azithro and cipro were equivalent. But as I said, cipro is more likely to have resistance problems than azithro or ceftriaxone. And as you probably are aware, most of our salmonella is not typhoid, so they call it the non-typhoidal salmonella. Most of it is the enteritides group. And if you do get the cholera suis group, it has a predilection to get into the bloodstream and it likes aortic grafts and aortic valves. Um, the labs give you a serotype, but they mean nothing to physicians because the treatment is the same, but it is helpful for epidemiologists. And then um, typhoid is called enteric fever but paratyphoid can also give you, quote, enteric fever. And there is no vaccine for paratyphoid, but it tends to be less virulent. 
And remember the Bacteremia strains are cholera suis in Dublin, likely named after Dublin, Ireland. But cholera suis gets most of the claim to fame, and it likes endothelium, plaques, valves, prosthesis. Uh, and then you know the classic risk factors, HIV, steroid, cancer, sickle cell, iron overload, et cetera. Now, what pet has been implicated for salmonella? The turtle, of course. And not just the turtle, but all reptiles and amphibians, the iguana, the snake, and even the frog. So all of these can carry salmonella. And then if you look in the U.S., a typhoid was big in 120 years ago, and then it disappeared, and now is obviously very rare. And we attribute that to improved sanitation and chlorination of water. So you can see typhoid historically disappeared in the early 1900s. And in the world, the green is where most of the typhoid exists. Now, the organism that looks like this and causes potentially a third of all Guillain-Barre syndrome is which organism? Correct, Campylobacter. And remember, Campy is impossible to eradicate because it has animal reservoir especially chickens, and it's the second lowest infectious dose after Shigella. And like Vibrio, it's comma-shaped, and it's unique when you're trying to grow it. It grows at warmer than room temperature. And then they want you to know the biggest point is it's inherently resistant to Cipro, and you do not want to use Cipro. And the drug of choice tends to be a macrolide such as azithromycin. So there's the picture of campy, which can be filamentous, gram-negative rod, curved, and flagellum, similar to Vibrio. The common ones are jejunii, coli, and fetus. And macrolide is drug of choice. And cipro disc shows no activity and erythro macrolide shows great activity. Okay, this kid is uh, in his teens and he has right lower quadrant rebound tenderness, goes for a presumed appendectomy, appendix is normal, and instead they find mesenteric lymphadenopathy. So what bug tends to come to mind? Yersinia. Yersinia intercolitica, very good. Now Yersinia, unlike Campy, which grows in warm temperature, it grows in the cold, it's cryophilic. So remember the two major cryophilic bugs that grow in the cold are Yersinia intercolitica and Listeria. So this one has a predilection for the mesenteric lymphadenitis it also, like Salmonella shigella campi, can give you autoimmune writers-like syndrome, reactive arthritis. Uh, and then remember, it can grow in the cold. In the old days, it used to be a occasional contaminant of packed red blood cells, which are stored in the cold, and this organism actually grows in the cold. And food outbreaks have been reported. This one tends, was chitterlins, chitlins, which is pork intestine, and tofu. Now, another organism is associated with kids 1 to 10 years of age. They tend to um, get it from lack of hand-to-mouth hygiene, and it could be acquired from handling animals, like a petting zoo, and feeding the animals, uh, and not washing hands. And then you get 
this hemolytic red cell picture, brain problems with confusion, diarrhea starts watery and then becomes bloody. And then you can either die of this or have renal failure or brain damage. So what's the bug? Any guess? Shigella? Well, this is HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. And this is the EHEC, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. There's the glomerulus showing damage. And there. And you can see the EHEC um, has a shiga like toxin. It does not damage the enterocytes. And even though it has a bloody diarrhea, and almost all bloody diarrheas have fecal leukocytes, this one does not because it actually is not an invasive pathogen. It sticks onto the surface but does not invade. And so, therefore, the fecal leukocytes are usually negative, even though the stool's bloody. So what happens is by your immune response having mimicry, the immune response not only tries to get rid of the EHEC, but it also attacks the kidneys, attacks the red cells, and attacks the brain. And that's why you get this systemic syndrome. And as we mentioned, it's the young, classically, and the famous serotype is the 015787. Uh, it likes the 1 to 10-year-old, 5% mortality, 30% brain damage, renal failure, leading cause in children. And then it's the EHEC as opposed to ETEC or EPEC. ETEC we already talked about, so I'll skip that. Now, hamburgers were the classic vehicle because 1% of cows have E. coli 015787. And um, all the leftover meat at the end of the day from the killing many cows gets stuck into the hamburger. So you could have a 30, 40, 50% chance it's in the hamburger, whereas a steak is only one cow, one steak, much less likely to get it from a steak. Um, now, there was an outbreak in Europe, and what was different about this outbreak was it also caused HUS, but it was more of an enteroaggregative E. coli as opposed to enterohemorrhagic. And the key people who got sick were not 1 to 10-year-old. They were 20-year-old. So that was a little different. And it wasn't the 015787. It was the 0104H4. And Germany seemed to be the leading country in Europe that had it. And one article was quite interesting where they gave um, three or four patients who had HUS with bad outcomes, potentially. And they gave them eculizumab, which is a monoclonal C5 antibody. And it knocked out terminal complement. And uh, they actually improved. So there is a potential treatment. But three people is not going to get you on the FDA list. But at least there is some hope for HUS treatment. But as you know, eculizumab knocking out terminal complement could potentially increase your risk for meningococcal meningitis, so that needs to be prevented. Okay, so enterohemorrhagic E. coli, the shiga like toxin also produced by E. coli, not just shigella, and the reservoirs in the gut of cattle. Remember, the diarrhea is watery, and then it becomes bloody, but the fecal leukocytes are negative. And then um, the other ones that we're not going to really talk in detail about are enteroinvasive E. coli, which also can utilize the toxin. 
enteropathogenic E. coli and enteroaggregative E. coli. Okay, and some of those may need treatment or may not. If you do treat them, azithro for three days versus Cipro is usually the drug of choice. Uh, and then this is a bloody diarrhea associated with cutaneous ulcers. And the organism is much bigger than a bacteria, 10 times bigger. And it's eating red cells called erythrophagocytosis. And it's causing the Erlenmeyer flask in your chemistry lab. And it looks like a volcano erupting. So here's the classic volcano of amoeba and the ulcerations of the colon and the Crohn's-like ulceration granulomatous that may occur, uh, which is rare, but you have to keep it in mind, the cyst versus the trophozoite. And then uh, besides the intestine, there's the liver. This was a resident from India who actually had a amoebic abscess. And it um, would look like this. And if you aspirate it, they classically describe it as anchovy paste, which would look like that. Uh, and then other sites are very rare. So colon and liver are the big ones. Um, and then occasionally you can see it in men who have sex with men. Um, flagyl versus tinidazole. And they also get into you know, treating not just the luminal phase with a different uh, drug, which is where sometimes uh, the tinidazole comes in. And then when you have a focal liver lesion, you want to think of three possibilities. One is amoeba, which we covered, and then um, the classic bacteria, which is on your boards, is the one with the positive string test which they used to think was in Asia primarily, which it is, but it's also in the rest of the world, including here. And what's unique about that Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is the bug, is it's very hypermucoid. So it gives you the string test, which looks like snot because it's got a lot of mucopolysaccharides formation. Uh, and then the third liver lesion, Unlike amoeba and Klebsiella, which gives you an inflammatory response, fever, leukocytosis, this one is not an inflammatory response, and it gets picked up incidentally by scans or pressure, or worst case scenario is either it spontaneously ruptures or you stick a needle into it, and they have anaphylaxis, uh, and then it may have septations. So I think we gave it away. It's called echinococcus. If it goes to the lungs, which it can do besides the liver, um, you would see um, a water lily sign, which I'll show you a picture of. Uh, if you did go some third world medicine, it would be very helpful for you to take a few hour course on ultrasonography and take a portable ultrasound device with you so when you see people that have, say, a big abdomen or pain, you can actually ultrasound them right then and there with your device. And if you ultrasound this kid's liver, you'll find the cyst in it, and you find the white little particles called hydatid sand, pretty pathognomonic for echinococcus. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, when it's in the lung, the classic CAT scan or X-ray is the water lily sign, which is the hydronumo cavity with the water lily, like the water lily floating on top if you use your imagination. Uh, and then the two big species are the hydatid disease granulosis, which is found in the world in the black there. Uh, and then Usually, it's connected with the sheep-sheep-dog connection. Out west is the bad, worst one of all, as well as in Asia, is the multiloccularis, 
this one is called alveolar echinococcus. It grows from both ends. It's in the fox rodent population. Humans are incidental hosts, and just like that rat with all those cysts in its liver, that's what the human can do throughout the whole peritoneal cavity. So very hard to treat that one. And again, the dog is featured in there. You can get contamination of vegetables, berries, water, but again, mostly in Asia, Europe. Uh, and then there's the famous cyst and the two differences, multilocularis versus granulosis, the anaphylaxis. So when we had a case at Moffitt, we gave them uh, pre-op hydrocortisone to prevent the anaphylaxis and cut the cyst out. Uh, all the cestodes are treated with prosequantral, but you can also use um, albendazole, uh, which is what we used. And then we have what's called the PEAR procedure, which is puncture, aspirate it, inject it with hypertonic saline, which we did not do because it can cause rarely sclerosis and cholangitis, re-aspirate and try to cut out the capsule and there you have it. You'll find pieces of what looks like the hooks in the head of a cestoad, or it's degenerating. Okay, I've got a f 12 minutes or less, so we'll just keep moving through a few little points on each one. Uh, this guy was fishing in Tampa Bay, bumped something in the water while waiting and cut his leg, and he drinks a lot of beer. He may be iron overloaded. He got a little cellulitis. He got some Keflex. He goes home. He's now back. He's septic, and he could have been eating some raw oysters, so the salt water connection is there. And now you got this necrotizing cellulitis, fasciitis, bullous formation, and they wind up usually at the VA or Tampa General. Um, have not had a case at Moffitt yet, but you could. And uh, you get these hemorrhagic bullae. And when you culture it, you want to use the thiocitrate bile salt, TCBS, because it's salt. It's like salt water. And it's a curved gram-negative rod, so you would recognize this as what? Anybody? Vibrio von Effigens? You are correct. And there's the skin grafting and the muscle flaps. Uh, these are courtesy of a VA patient, I believe, by Mark Brown in the many years ago. So there's the flap. These are more cases, maybe Tampa General case here, with the bullseye. And um, just to let you know, whenever hurricanes hit, like Katrina, whatever, you have flooding, salt water, you have people waiting in water, and you will have an increase, not mass numbers, but people that have the iron overload, cirrhosis, it's a liva bug, L-Y-V-A, liva, listeria, yersinia, vibrio, eremonis, all of them require exogenous iron to grow. Uh, it loves the summer months, so we're in the month of July heading to August, so that's about the peak. Uh, and then doxy and a cephalosporin combo are usually given. Uh, and then the mortality can be as high as 50%. So if you acquired this by food, this is the highest mortality of any organism, number one. And number two, vying for number two slot, is Listeria and Salmonella. So this is the highest mortality in the right patient, of course. Uh, the other Vibrios that are less virulent are Perihemolyticus, Alginolyticus. Again, salt water, uh, oysters, all that stuff, iron overload. So the big three are the Cholera Vulnificus and the Perihemolyticus and the TCBS auger. Okay. And then perihemolyticus is mild or you may not ever have a case. Now, if a alligator bites you or a leech is on you or you have fresh water 
exposure playing mud football, or you decide, let me sign up for that mud athlon, and you compete in the mud athlon, and you cut yourself, and it's fresh water pumped in there, or rain water. Uh, you can get what infection, especially if you're iron overloaded or immune suppressed. It's the A in LIVA, so what's the A stand for? Any guess? The A? Aeromonas. 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 Hydrophila. Hydro water filla loves water. Aeromonas. We've had 10 cases at Moffitt. They were all in GI biliary tract cancer patients. And one guy swam in his pool. That was him. And he died of a sepsis, fasc neck fash, aeromonas. So we see those occasionally at Moffitt. And we see them with hurricanes with water collecting and people cleaning up their yard and their immune suppressed. They could cut themselves and get aeromonas that way. So aeromonas can look like Vibrio vulnificus. The third one, um, which is not as common and it doesn't fit our nice LIVA acronym is this one here, Plesiomonas shigalloides. Its name sounds pretty ominous, but it also requires exogenous iron. And as a fellow at Tampa General or a resident, I remember an alcoholic lady um, came in with bloody diarrhea, was sent home, came in when I was on call and because uh, she was sent home and then came right back in 24 hours. Septic died in 24 hours and uh, she had probably iron overload liver disease and she died of plesiomonas shigalloidae so it can do the same thing vibrio and aeromonas is but it's less common it likes the brackish water which is salt fresh mixture and florida is on the list of plesiomonas now if you eat some potato salad and you throw up in two to six hours you probably caught what Any Staph guess? Aureus. Back, Staph aureus food poisoning. Thank you very much. Short incubation. Remember that. No treatment. Supportive. And then the Bacillus cereus is tied with what food item, which is usually longer incubation, diarrhea versus vomiting, although the vomiting is short incubation. So you all know this one from memory, right? The fried rice. Okay. So Bacillus cereus. If you eat some oriental food and turn red, you may have a reaction to what seasoning? MSG, like monosodium glutamate, okay? Flushing headache. And then the third toxin bug is Clostridium perfringens, long incubation, more diarrhea. So what are the three big food poisonings? If you were going to write an article on it, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium perfringens, and Staph aureus, then you're get eating the performed toxin. And the different food items can differ, but I gave you examples. Staph could be anything that's left out too long, and the fried rice is the classic Bacillus, but you can get it other ways. Clostridium perfringens, they claim beef, but anything. You don't tend to get vomiting with Clostridium perfringens. Okay, um, that's the famous foodborne toxin article. Okay. Now, what if you have double vision dysarthria and you ate a fish or any other food and now you're heading towards the ventilator and you're getting a descending paralysis, which is the opposite of Guillain-Barre, which is ascending. So what would you think about descending paralysis, incubation one to two, two or day and a half? Anything you think of? This is a clinical diagnosis, by the way. And remember the floppy baby eating honey, so you recognize that as botulism. You can also have wound botulism, and it's a pure motor neuron problem knocking out the acetylcholine transmission across the motor nerve plate. 
You don't get sensory findings and the incubation is a day or so, which is different than other food poisonings. And the antitoxin can help uh, stop the progressive paralysis with needing rehab for six months and the waiting for your nerve terminals to regenerate. So remember, clinical diagnosis. Um, and you want to get it diagnosed as fast as possible to give the antitoxin, and you still can die of this. Uh, items of food have included potato salad, sautéed onion, fish, baked potatoes, chili sauce, carrot juice, the list goes on and on and on. Now, what if you uh, have cold feels hot, hot feels cold, perioral numbness, tooth feel like they're falling out of their socket, and you're hypotensive, bradycardic, and you need atropine, dopamine, and you're throwing up and having diarrhea and getting dehydrated, and you have eaten the reef fish of barracuda, grouper, or snapper that is longer than three feet. What did you get? Ciguatera. Ciguatera. There is no antidote, although they claim mannitol would reduce it. Number one fishborne illness worldwide, and it's heat stable, lipid soluble, and the large predatory fish have it in the flesh. So cooking does not help you, nor does freezing the meat. Uh, and then it's supportive care until they eventually feel better, but they may have paresthesias for six months. Not a fun thing to get. Uh, and then what if uh, you eat at Moffitt? We've had two cases where a um, dietitian ate some tuna fish and came in with redness and itching. We had a resident who ate mahi-mahi at a local Tampa restaurant and got the same problem. So what does tuna fish, mahi-mahi, and a red rash and itching like histamine give you? What's the, what's the problem? So that's scombroid, and these are the scombroid fish, including bluefish, mackerel. We give you some Benadryl and you're over it in a day or so. And then last but not least is the paralytic shellfish poisoning which occurs within 30 minutes of ingestion, so you're still at the restaurant. And unlike botulism, which has a longer incubation, in addition, it has paresthesias. And there is no antidote, and there's a 10% mortality. And then lastly is the brevitoxin uh, of the uh, red tide, which causes COPD asthma exacerbation from the brevitoxin in the air, from the surf hitting with the dead fish everywhere. And with that, I will stop because it's now 12 o'clock. And if you go to ID Podcast, you can get into uh, the rest of the talk, which will cover the four protozoa and a quick rundown of parasites. So thank you again for your attention, and I'm glad we got through most of the talk.